psychologist that's interested in human emotion. Uh, but more specifically, I'm interested in how certain emotions are inextricably linked to learning. Emotions like uh, shame and confusion. And so I do have good news and bad news in this presentation. And so I figured why not start with the bad news and kind of get that out of the way. And the bad news actually is, uh, according to recent ACT data, uh, a greater percentage of high school students are not ready for college level coursework. In fact, math readiness is at a 20 year low. And according to the uh, CEO of the ACT, we're at a very dangerous point and if we do nothing, it will keep on declining. And so you can see a large number of states are scoring 22 or below out of a possible 36 on the ACT, with a significant number of states actually scoring 20 or below. And this is even more concerning when you really focus in and look at readiness uh, related to math and science. And it's not just the ACT data that's showing these negative trends. In fact, if you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which has been called the nation's report card, you can see that 40% of 12th graders are scoring below a basic understanding in science. And so, uh, I do believe that there is good news. I do believe that there are are certain steps that we can take today that can actually start to alleviate some of these issues. And one of these steps is to get an understanding that our emotions are tied into learning. And we need to begin to harness the power of these emotions in educational settings. Now, of course, this is something that's not going to be easy. In fact, it's very difficult to study human emotion. In fact, not that long ago, it was thought to be impossible. But a scientific study of emotions does have a rich history. In fact, you can go back to the 1800s, and uh, there was a French physician by the name of Duchesne who actually believed that we had up to 60 different distinct emotions. And his evidence for this was essentially he would shock people's faces, and whatever emotional expression that he was able to elicit by shooting electricity into someone's face he thought that was evidence of a unique, distinct emotion. Now, of course, not, not everyone agreed with this, with this premise. In fact, Charles Darwin, who's of course best known for his writings in biology, as it turns out, Darwin really was in some sense one of the first experimental psychologists because of his interest in human emotions. And so he was, he was aware of the work that had been done by Duchesne. And I love this quote, he looked at it and simply said, I don't believe this, this isn't true. Um, and so he decided he was going to set out to conduct his own research looking into emotions. And so he did this, and unlike Duchesne, who said we had up to 60 different emotions, Darwin said that we have more uh, basic, a smaller number of basic universal emotions. And of course, he wrote about this in his 1872 book called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Jump ahead about 100 years, and you've got a, a psychologist by the name of Paul Ekman, who actually traveled the globe studying emotions. And he came to a conclusion that was similar to Darwin. He said that, yes, we do have a small number of basic core emotions, but Ekman came up and, and said that we have six in particular. We have surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, happiness, and fear. And this work that was done by Ekman does con uh, continue to be a foundation for much of the research that's currently done uh, in emotion. But the problem I have with Ekman's six basic emotions is that they're not prevalent in learning. I mean, in the purest sense of the word, I'm not going to experience fear when I'm studying for an upcoming psychology exam. And so I'm interested in academic emotions, in learning-centered emotions, things like frustration and boredom and eureka and flow and curiosity and engagement. Uh, and you don't see any of those here in Ekman's six basic emotions. And so I was part of a study that was done back in the early 2000s, and we actually found that there were certain emotions that were more relevant to learning outside of Ekman's six basic emotions. In fact, uh, as you can see, not surprisingly, we found that boredom was not good for learning. That's not a surprise. Uh, flow, being engaged with the material, that was good for learning. But the most surprising and counterintuitive finding was that confusion was actually beneficial for learning. So the more confused our participants were, the more they actually learned. However, we now know that that confusion alone 
is not responsible for learning. So don't misinterpret what I'm saying and assume that more confusion always equals more learning. Um, of course, there are, there are instances in which confusion is going to be good for learning and instances in which confusion is going to be bad for learning. So imagine a, a student who's engaged with the material and they reach an impasse and they get confused and they're able to resolve that confusion and they get re-engaged with the material. That's a learning opportunity. This is what we call productive confusion. However, imagine another student who's working on the material and they, they reach an impasse and they get confused, but they're unable to resolve that confusion. So they spiral down into a frustration and boredom cycle and they become disengaged with the material and they give up, right? That's hopeless confusion. So of course, no one would expect any learning to occur in those situations. So as an instructor, you might be asking yourself, okay, well, if I know that confusion is beneficial under certain circumstances, are there ways in which I should be intentionally confusing my students in order to maximize learning? And we actually researched that question in my lab recently, and so we had a number of different methods in which we, uh, on purpose, uh, confused students to see which method of confusion induction was most beneficial to learning. And of course, we compared this to a control condition, which was a kind of a simple lecture-based format, not unlike what you would get uh, you know, watching an educational YouTube video or, or uh, sitting in on a lecture. And in this particular study, we were attempting to teach our students physics. And so what we found was that in the context of physics, Coupled with what are called breakdown scenarios, we found that this was the best way to conf confuse students that produced the highest learning gains. And so let me briefly explain what I mean by a breakdown scenario. So imagine you're a learner, and I show you this illustration, and I tell you that, okay, you, you put a key in a lock, and you turn the key, and the bolt doesn't move. In other words, the lock doesn't work. So now your job is to attempt to figure out why this lock is not working the way that it's supposed to without being given any additional information or any additional scaffolding. And so again, when we were teaching physics, coupled with these breakdown scenarios, we found that students learned from pre-test to post-test an equivalent of three and a half letter grades. Um, so this was a massive gain, and of course, this was significantly better uh, than people who were learning the same information in the absence of these breakdown scenarios. So in the interest of time, let me keep moving, and I want to talk about another emotion that I've been interested in recently, and it's the idea of shame. And so why is it that I want to research shame? Well, the fact is, shame is everywhere. Shame is prevalent. Uh, it's, in fact, shame has been called a silent epidemic. And in fact, there has been a lot of research done on shame, but there has not been a lot of research done on academic shame. That is, shame that occurs in a learning environment. And so in my lab, I've been interested in two broad questions. Number one, is it even possible to have a scientific study of shame? Um, can you quantify shame? Can you, can you induce it in a laboratory? Can you measure it reliably? And if so, what impact does this shame have on learning? And so the answer to the first research question we have found seems to be yes. In fact, certain students who share these characteristics are the ones who most often show uh, shame in a controlled laboratory environment. When they have an expectation of success, However, they experience a per, uh, this, this perception of failure, but according to measures of individual differences, they also have a proneness to shame. And none of that is overly surprising, but it's nice that we've been able to show this consistently and replicate this finding in a laboratory ses, uh, setting. But the broader question, arguably the more important question, is what impact does this shame have on learning? And so in this particular study, we were actually interested in teaching students about the circulatory system. And in two groups of students, we actually, uh, we manipulated and, and we had a little bit of difference in what we did between the two groups. In one group of students, we actually intentionally induced shame right before they were told to learn all they could about the circulatory system. So they're feeling shameful, and then we turn them loose and say, learn you all you can about the circulatory system. And in a second group, we actually, it was our control group, and we just said, look, learn as much as you can about the, the circulatory system. 
And so uh, I, I promised myself I wasn't going to show any sort of graphs or data or numbers in this talk, but this was the best way to really convey this information because it actually is really exciting information. And so what we found, if you look at the bottom line there, that yellow line, this is our, our control group. These are the students who did not have shame going into the learning session to learn all they could about the circulatory system. And you can see we broke it down again into shame proneness, um, those that have this high tendency to experience shame versus those who have a low tendency to experience shame. And there's not a lot of interesting going on. I mean, the good news is they, they learned a little bit, right? They had about an eight to 10% increase across the two different groups. And the fact is, this is actually pretty consistent with what other research has shown. I mean, when you leave students alone to study, most often they're going to activate misconceptions uh, they're not going to pay the utmost attention, and they're actually going to leave more confident in those misconceptions. And so this kind of lines up with that. But what's really exciting is when you look at the line on the top, these are the students that were experiencing shame right before they were attempting to learn new information about the circulatory system. As you can see, those who were experiencing shame who also have a low shame proneness, that is, these are people who are not likely to experience shame, they're not accustomed to experiencing shame, but when they do experience shame, it seems to be beneficial. These people are learning a lot. In fact, from pre-test to post-test, you're seeing a 35% learning gain, again, from pre-test to post-test, in people who experience shame who are not accustomed to shame. Now, I should point out that these are very preliminary results, it, hot off the presses, literally three to four days old. Um, so obviously this warrants further investigation, but it does appear that shame can be beneficial. It appears that shame is activating some sort of underlying cognitive mechanism that seems to be beneficial to learning. Because if you look at the other group who experienced shame right before they were told to learn about the circulatory system, those who had high shame proneness, they're not learning nearly as much as they should or nearly as much as they could. So it appears that the argument could be made that shame takes cognition hostage. In other words, it's dampening down any subsequent learning that's attempting to occur. So in conclusion, what can we take away from all of this? We know that confusion is better than a standard information delivery. We know that more confusion is not always better. I believe that confusion needs to be thought of as a slingshot. For some students, it can propel them into higher altitudes of learning. But for other students, the slingshot will break and it'll cause negligible or perhaps even detrimental learning gains. We also know that there are certain methods in which to induce confusion in your students that seem to be better to maximize learning. In the context of physics, as we just saw, breakdown scenarios seem to produce the highest learning gains. And in relation to academic shame, I feel that as instructors, we need to be conscientious. We need to be cautious and remain neutral when, we, when we're talking about expectations of success. We should stay away from statements like, this is something that shouldn't be that difficult for you, or this is something that shouldn't take that long. Because as we just saw, those students who believe that they're gonna do well, who have a perception of failure, who also have a high proneness to shame, those are the ones that are going to feel shame. And as we just saw, that shame does take cognition hostage. However, the good news also appears to be that shame is not all bad all the time. And so I hope that you found some of this information useful and that you're able to implement it successfully into your own educational experiences. Thank you.